I'm back with another monster ranking for D&D. This time around, we're going to be looking at one of my all-time favorite monsters, the Sphinx. It took third place in my top 10 D&D monsters video in 2020, and it took second place in the prior top 10 D&D monsters video in 2017. So it's way up there in my book. It's alongside greats like dragons, vampires, hags, and liches. But in doing my research for this video, I came across something that I had sort of forgotten. The Sphinx was not always this awesome in D&D. Sure, they were always very cool, but it really was 5th edition that brought them to the heights that they're at now. I also want to say a quick thank you and give some recognition to a supporter of mine called Heimko, who participated in the raffle that I did as part of my recent Kickstarter for my upcoming 5 ebook. Monstrous Heroes. He won one of the prizes in the raffle, which was to choose the topic of a video, and he wanted a Sphinx ranking. That was much to my own gladness. So thank you, Heimko, for being a part of the Kickstarter and the raffle. As I've done in recent rankings, I'm going to go over entries found in 3E, 4E, and 5E. And in case you're wondering, I don't include older editions of D&D because unfortunately I never played them, so I do not consider myself qualified enough to really give them a good assessment, uh, particularly where the mechanics are concerned. On the other hand, 3rd, 4th, and 5th edition I have played, DM'd, studied, and created content for in massive proportion, so I feel confident enough with those. As with many creatures in D&D, the Sphinx comes from real-world mythology and history. It is a mythical creature with the body of a lion and the head of a human often depicted wearing a royal headdress. It is a symbol of wisdom, mystery, and enigma in various ancient cultures, especially Egyptian and Greek. The most famous Sphinx structure is the Great Sphinx of Giza, located near the pyramids in Egypt. This colossal statue stands about 66 feet tall and is believed to represent the pharaoh Khafre. The Sphinx is renowned for its riddles and its association with the falcon-headed sun god, Ra. The most famous sphinx from mythology is actually never given a name. She appears in the ancient Greek legend of Oedipus. The sphinx was said to have terrorized the city of Thebes, posing a riddle to anyone who wished to pass. The riddle asked what creature walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, and three legs in the evening. Oedipus successfully answered the riddle by responding, man, signifying the stages of human life. The Sphinx was thus vanquished, and Oedipus went on to become a hero. So, right from the beginning, the Sphinx is a creature that is just ripe for adventure, and danger, and heroic storytelling. As D&D often does, it takes portions of this, amplifies certain bits, and adds in some new bits. Let's jump into the ranking and see what the actual D&D Sphinxes have to offer. Unsurprisingly, there are no F-tier Sphinxes. It's in mid-D tier that things start off. First up is the Hyraka Sphinx from 3.5 Edition's Monster Manual. I really like the name Hyraka Sphinx. It just sounds awesome. But unfortunately, it's a very simple and plain monster. The 3.5 Monster Manual has actually very bare-bones lore for Sphinxes, simply saying that they are creatures with lion-like bodies and feathery wings, and they are enigmatic and territorial. The Hyraka Sphinx has no illustration, but it is described as having a falcon head. They are always male, they're of low, ogre-like intelligence, and chaotic evil in alignment. They seek out Gynosphinxes, the female variety of Sphinx, which we'll see later on. The lore doesn't say if the Hyraka-Sphinxes search for Gynosphinxes to mate with them or to do battle with them or what. Otherwise, the Hyraka-Sphinx is a fairly straightforward beast-like combatant. It bites, it claws, it pounces, or maybe it makes flyby attacks, and that's pretty much it. It's not a terrible creature, but certainly not a great one. And that's the only entry in D tier. Now we rise on up to low C tier with the Cryo Sphinx, also from Monster Manual 1 in 3.5e. And it also has no illustration of its own, 
but it is described as a sphinx with a ram's head. And don't let the name mislead you, the cryosphinx has no cold-related powers. In fact, it doesn't really have any special abilities or magical effects or spells or anything. They attack with their ram horns instead of biting, and they have the same claws, pounce, rake, flyby attack as all the sphinxes in this edition. Like the Hyracosphinx, they're all male, and they spend a great deal of time seeking out the female Gynosphinx. Unlike the Hyracosphinx, the Cryosphinx is neutral aligned, and it possesses human level intelligence. Above all else, they are greedy things obsessed with collecting treasure. Moving up to high C tier is the Sara Sphinx from the 3.5 book Sandstorm, one of the environment focused books of that edition, along with Frostburn and Stormrack. At the beginning of the Sphinx section in Sandstorm, there is actually a copy and paste of the same simplistic lore paragraph in the Monster Manual, so I find that odd. The Sara Sphinx is the least good of the four sphinxes in the book, like the least well-made in my opinion. Really, I think it's just a wasted opportunity. Mechanically, it doesn't really have anything different from that basic Hyraka Sphinx. It has no illustration, but the descriptive text says it has a reptilian face along with the standard Leonin body and avian wings. In combat, it does not bite. It only attacks with the same claw, pounce, rake, flyby attack as the others. It's actually not very inclined to violence, however. Sara Sphinxes are actually very civilized creatures who are interested in conversation and learning from sages. They're of human level intelligence, and like lizards, they like to sun on warm rocks, and they detest being cold. This is a very role-playing focused and versatile Sphinx, but its boring spots hold it back quite a bit. I wish it would have been given just a couple more interesting features, or probably better yet, it could have just been cut from the book and that space used instead for some great lore and adventure hooks. Next up is the 5E Cryosphinx, which comes from the book Plane Shift Amunket. This Plane Shift series is, uh, for better or worse, converting Magic the Gathering settings into 5th edition D&D. It continues with a style that we found in 3E. The current Cryosphinx, it still has the ram's head and it attacks with its horns and its claws. It has a trait called inscrutable, a really cool word by the way. And this trait means that no one can magically read its thoughts or its emotions and divination spells just don't work against it unless it allows them to. All of the Sphinxes in 5th edition have this inscrutable trait. It has legendary actions in the form of horn attacks and 120 foot teleportations, though it does not have legendary resistance. Aside from all that, it has true sight, it resists non-magical weapons, and is immune to psychic damage. Also it cannot be charmed or frightened. It can fly pretty fast and is an all around smart and strong creature though none of its ability scores are extremely high. And, just like I'd said before, it has no cold powers, despite being called a cryo-sphinx. This is so odd to me. We all know that the prefix cryo is associated with cold. It comes from Greek, even ancient Greek, literally meaning cold, frost, or ice. In the 3rd edition monster manual, there are cryohydras, and they have a breath weapon that deals cold damage and immunity to cold, and they live in cold environments. The Cryosphinx doesn't even come from a cold environment. They live in hot deserts, so who knows? The cool thing about the 5e Cryosphinx is that it actually has some really good artwork, and the lore isn't bad. The plain of Amunket is dominated by an evil elder dragon planeswalker known as Nicol Bolas who actually has been in Magic since 1994's Legends set. I remember him way back from those days. He was a really nasty, very powerful creature in those early days of Magic, and he still is, though reimagined in a modern way. I do have to laugh a bit about his name, though. If you're only an English speaker, it sounds pretty cool, Bolas. But if you speak Spanish or Portuguese, Bolas just means balls, so... um. 
Balls controls or at least influences the minds of all creatures on Amunket, with the exception of the Sphinxes, whose inscrutable minds resist his enchantment. Retaliating, Balls curse all the Sphinxes to silence. In fact, they cannot use any kind of communication, nonverbal or otherwise. This provides a couple interesting hooks for a campaign, which could serve for the adventurers in which they're trying to figure out what's going on with the Sphinxes, and after discovering their curse, trying to find a way to break this malediction upon them, or at least break the curse upon one of the Sphinxes, such that the characters could learn the valuable secrets it knows. At the top of C tier is the Crocus Sphinx from Sandstorm. It has the highest challenge rating of all the Sphinxes in 3rd edition at CR 12. In my opinion, it also has the best illustration of all the 3E e Sphinxes. As you can see, it is a nightmarish Sphinx with a crocodile head and tail. Sadly, it's really held back by its bare bones lore. All we really know is that they're chaotic evil, they're very aggressive, and they behave much like actual crocodiles, spending far more time in the water than flying, and they even mate with regular crocodiles. All of this despite the fact that they're actually more intelligent than an average human. The Crocus Sphinx doesn't have much more going on in the mechanics department than the other 3E e Sphinxes that we've seen thus far. The only major addition is that it has a bite attack that grabs onto prey, and thus it ambushes from rivers or ponds or oases and the like. The monster is powerful, it's fearsome, but it comes up short in other areas. Before we advance onto B tier, I want to mention that if you are not yet signed up for my free newsletter, make sure to do so. Scrolls of the Bard features 5e content that I create every month. You also get a dungeon or wilderness map and some of the cool freebies from time to time. See the link down in the video description. It just takes a second to sign up. You'll immediately receive the welcome issue, which has a fighter subclass called Battle Priest. Three dynamic monsters are in there, and of course a welcome message from me. If you want to get even more out of the newsletter, consider becoming a patron, which gives you two monsters each issue, an even bigger dungeon map, and an entry into monthly drawings. Either way, you have my gratitude. And now, back to the ranking. Starting off low B tier is the Canis Sphinx, also from 3.5 Sandstorm. As the name suggests, and as you can see, the Sphinx has the head of a canine. According to the descriptive text, it is the head of a jackal. The illustration here is quite nice, as most of the illustrations of this era are. It harkens to a time when almost all the art in tabletop RPGs was traditional, hand-drawn art. In fact, the art is done by none other than Ron Spencer an artist whose work I very much enjoyed in my early days of playing Magic the Gathering. I still love his older pieces. He's got all kinds of greats. Bog Imp, Bog Rats, Crypt Cobra, Dire Wolves, Flow of Maggots, Goblin Digging Team, Goblin Shrine, Marsh Viper, Necrite, Plague Bearer, Word of Binding, my all-time favorite magic piece of his is Ashen Ghoul from Ice Age. Just amazing stuff. The Canis Sphinx overall isn't really any better than the Crocus Sphinx, with the exception of one important thing. It actually gets a unique feature. In this case, it has a three times per day roar. The first time it roars, it has a crazy massive 200 foot radius effect. This effect inflicts fear. If it roars a second time in the same encounter, the radius decreases to a still massive 100 foot radius, which can inflict both fear and paralysis. And if a third roar comes in the same encounter, the radius goes down to 50 feet, which is still really big, and it can inflict ongoing damage to a creature's strength score. Multiple Canis Sphinxes roaring together even get stacking effects, so wow. This feature alone is what pushes the Canis Sphinx into low B tier. 
as its lore is, once again, nothing to get very inspired over. It's described as usually neutral evil. It's an intelligent hunter that will pursue prey in the desert until the prey drops from exhaustion. And indeed, the Canis Sphinx even has the track feet. Well-designed monster in some regards, but not in all ways. Getting into mid-beat here is the Andrus Sphinx from the 3.5 Monster Manual. This is one of the core Sphinxes of D&D, along with the Gynus Sphinx. Andrus Sphinxes are all male, and in this edition of the game, they were chaotic good in alignment, which is quite different from where they are nowadays. They are gruff, and they are not fond of flattery or placation or someone who overdoes it on the pleasantries but they do have noble hearts. Unfortunately, the 3.5 Monster Manual has no illustration for the Andrus Sphinx, but their descriptive text does depict the most classic and iconic Sphinx appearance with a lion body, feathered wings, and the head of a regal human man. They can cast up to third level cleric spells and they have the signature roar feature. The range is just incredible. The first roar has a radius of 500 feet. The second and third roars have a radius of 250 feet each. The first effect is fear for 2d6 rounds. The second roar afflicts paralysis for 1d4 rounds and deafness for 2d6 rounds. And the third roar deals 2d4 points of strength damage for 2d4 rounds, which is just absolutely brutal. Furthermore, stone and crystalline objects within 90 feet might get shattered to pieces, even magic objects. This is a really good monster with a great theme, great abilities, highly engaging in a social way, and it is fairly versatile. The lack of illustration and the short, simple lore are its weak spots. I'm honestly shocked that the 3.5 Monster Manual has nothing regarding riddles when it comes to the Andrus Sphinx. They are shown to be highly intelligent, and riddles are such a classic aspect of Sphinxes, but were left in the dark as to what the designers were thinking in terms of the Andrus Sphinx's motivations, goals, and quirks. Sticking with the baseline Sphinxes, we come to high B tier with the 4th edition Sphinx. That's right, it's just called Sphinx. It is a 16th level elite monster. Now keep in mind here that 4E was a 30 level system instead of a 20 level system. So in 5E terms, that would translate to something like a CR11 creature. Also an elite monster means that it has the power and the resilience of two monsters in one. Oddly though, it only makes one attack per round and it only gets one single usage of an action point, sort of like a legendary action or the fighter's action surge in 5e lingo. It also gets one usage of second wind, which is sort of like dodge plus regaining a quarter of your total hit points all in one action. It has a good illustration by Jim Nelson. He did a lot of pieces in 4e. We see the traditional Sphinx body and the head is sort of between lion and human, maybe a bit more lion than human. It has the familiar claw and pounce attacks, but oddly, no bite attack. Also, its roar has been reduced to a minor action that afflicts a lesser fear effect. Negative two to attack rolls with repeated saves at the end of the affected creature's turns to end the effect. This might be the most disappointing thing about the 4E Sphinx. The roar is about as opposite as you could get from the 3E one. Interestingly, the designers chose to include the Sphinx's challenge as part of the creature's mechanics. Before entering into combat, the Sphinx poses a challenge to the characters, such as a riddle or a debate of religious or philosophical ideas. If the characters fail this challenge, the Sphinx gets plus two to attacks and defenses, aka armor class and saving throws, along with an additional action point and an additional usage of its second wind. There is a sidebar about the Sphinx's challenge, which I find peculiar, like it's helpful and unhelpful all at the same time. The suggestions and the ideas are spot on. 
but they're just so abrupt. They're just so short given what we're dealing with here. Religious and philosophical ideas deal with the biggest, deepest, and most complex aspects of mortal existence. You can't just say, hey kiddos, have the Sphinx challenge the characters in theological argument. At the very least, this needs to have some examples and how to implement them into a role-playing scene or a skill challenge. Like with so many things in 4E, it's a good concept, but a poor execution. The Sphinx lore in the 4th edition Monster Manual isn't bad, though it doesn't have enough space to really get fleshed out. This is the moment in D&D when the Sphinx was solidified as an immortal guardian of a sacred location. This will get expanded upon in 5E, and I think it is such an inspiring and important role in the fantasy world. A mystical, majestic, and highly dangerous guardian of an ancient temple or tomb is just such a timeless archetype of mythic storytelling. Just a hair better is the Sphinx Mystery, also from 4E, this time found in Monster Manual 2. It is a level 19 monster, which is around CR 13 in 5E terms. This creature takes the top of B tier because it has a bit more going on mechanically. Its lore is even more sparse and undercooked, but the core Sphinx in 4E didn't get fleshed out enough anyways. Basically, the Sphinx mystery has an extreme obsession with asking the characters riddles. It's a compulsion that drives it. The way they're described in the book makes them seem fairly aggressive too, and even in the uh, example encounter that's provided, it's allied with Nothics and Minotaurs, which Minotaurs, as we know, are highly aggressive, warrior or brute type creatures, and Nothics are connected to secrets and the evil god Vecna. There is also a quick line in the lore that says some scholars believe the Sphinxes were actually created not by the gods, but by the primordials before the gods even existed. But that's the first I've ever heard of such an idea. Anyway, getting into the good stuff, the Sphinx Mystery has an attack called Bite of Ages that damages the target while knocking it prone and inflicting the immobilized condition. It has a minor action called Riddle Me This, which dazes a target, meaning you're limited to just a standard action or a move action or a minor action. You just get to pick one. A character can make an intelligence history check to try to solve the riddle and end the dazed condition. If the target doesn't try to solve the riddle, it takes 2d8 psychic damage at the end of its turn. An ally can also attempt to solve it, though succeeding will cause that psychic damage as it frees the dazed ally. The Sphinx Mystery has another special attack called Corrective Mauling that deals an even higher amount of damage and again knocks the target prone. And once per encounter, it has a great roar that deals thunder damage, pushes the creatures back 25 feet, and knocks them prone. That's right, this creature has three different features that knock enemies prone, though it doesn't have anything that combos off of it affecting prone creatures in some other way. Another quirk is that its basic attack is called Ancient Claws, but it's just a regular attack. There's nothing special to it, so I don't understand where the ancient part comes in. Aside from a couple wonky bits, this is a solid creature. It's one that serves as a powerful, high damage, prone knocking brute, along with the fact that it's this compulsive riddler. It will be a memorable encounter, for sure. I appreciate that the designers actually attempted to incorporate the riddle-asking nature of the Sphinx into one of its main abilities. You could criticize it for being a bit too dry and mechanical, but you could say the same criticism about all of 4E. I think that the Riddle Me This feature works well for what it is, and it's cool to see a skill get involved in a combat encounter like this. History, no less, which is not exactly a skill that gets a lot of love. The B-tier Sphinxes are all fine and well, all certainly worthwhile, though they really make me want to get into the even better entries that they are nodding to. Moving into low A-tier is the last Sphinx from 3.5e's Sandstorm, the Threska Sphinx. Another unfortunate case of having no illustration, so we just have to go off the text descriptions. 
The Sphinx has the head of an ibis, which I think could be a really beautiful appearance. It actually kind of makes me think of the Nycta Sphinx from my book, which has an owl head. They dwell in bodies of water, often among flocks of ibises, and they are considered the sages of Sphinx kind. Now, post 3E Sphinxes are basically all sage-like, but before this point, the Thresca Sphinx really is the pinnacle of this role. Plenty of the 3E Sphinxes are not sage-like at all, some of them are actually just very bestial. The Thresca Sphinx are neutral good in alignment, and they're not particularly fond of violence. And one thing that they are really well known for is creating magic items, particularly wondrous items. They do not craft many of these wonders, but the ones that they make are so great that they draw the attention of adventurers and other far-traveling treasure seekers. The Thresca Sphinx is highly intelligent and incredibly wise. It has a number of well-trained skills at its disposal, and it can cast up to third level druid spells. It is also the fastest flyer of all the third edition sphinxes. I like how the sphinx has bits of lore that add something to the world building and gives us a ready connection to be an NPC in an adventure. Along with its dynamic features and its flexible nature, it's a solid low A tier creature. Moving on, we have the Gyna Sphinx from the 3.5 Monster Manual this is the female counterpart to the Andra Sphinx. She is similar to the other 3.5 Sphinxes in many respects, though with some key differences. For one, she has an illustration. How about that? And it's a great illustration at that. Both bestial and feminine. Beautiful and fearsome. Fantastical and informed by some realism. This represents really the end of an era, when sphinxes still had more of a balance of human-like features. After this edition of the game, the tendency has been to make the baseline sphinxes decidedly more animalistic. Another main difference is that she also has charisma-based innate spells, mostly divination magic, though also dispel magic and remove curse. Furthermore, once per week, she can create a symbol spell, which are extremely potent magics like symbol of death, symbol of insanity, symbol of stunning. In this edition of D&D, the Gynosphinxes are the ones who love riddles and other intellectual challenges. Rather than being a kind of mystical guardian, she takes part in the riddles and puzzles simply out of amusement or enjoyment. Gynosphinxes are neutral in alignment, and they utterly despise the ram-headed cryosphinxes and the falcon-headed hyracosphinxes that we saw early on in the lower parts of the ranking. In mid A tier, we come across a unique sphinx called Esperia, which is found in the 5e book Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, a campaign setting that draws from the Magic the Gathering plane of Ravnica City of Guilds. Esperia is the current leader of the Azoria Senate, a lawful neutral faction of legislators, bureaucrats, judges, and law enforcers. Esperia is described as aloof. She values solitude more than anything, but she is compelled to relinquish her privacy due to the growing crime and disorder in Ravnica. Despite her standoffish nature, Esperia leads her guild with unwavering dedication, relying on her vast knowledge of Ravnica's complex legal system to serve as the supreme judge and to, above all else, promote order. She employs non-lethal means to subdue offenders, prioritizing the law's role in dispensing justice. Alas, her lore stops there in the book. I read through the whole description of the Azoria Senate, but it contains no additional information about Esperia herself. She does have some fantastic artwork, and you might be struck by how big she is. I believe this is the biggest sphinx in all of D&D, and she is categorized as gargantuan, which really there's no upper limit to how big a gargantuan creature can even be in 5th edition. 
She has a very high challenge rating of 21, though I noticed that her armor class is 17, which is no better than the challenge rating 11 Gynasphinx. This does seem a little odd, but then again, she has such abilities as twice per day innately casting the 9th level spell Imprisonment, along with spell casting like a 15th level Cleric that also has Counterspell, and let's not forget Magic Resistance, a number of really solid saving throws, and three instances of Legendary Resistance per day. As an action, she can cast a spell and attack with a claw, and her claw does more than just slashing damage. The target that is hit must succeed on a DC 23 wisdom save or take 4d6 psychic damage every time it attacks Asperia in a round. She also has an action called Supreme Legal Authority in which she targets up to three creatures, each of which must make a DC 23 intelligence saving throw. Impossible for many characters and very difficult for anyone who's not a wizard or an artificer. On a failed save, Asperia chooses a kind of action, such as attack or cast a spell, and the character cannot use that kind of action for a minute. To top things off, Asperia has three legendary actions per round that give her extra claw attacks or spell castings or usages of supreme legal authority. Asperia is one of the most powerful control creatures I've ever seen. Combined with some epic art, she is well deserving of A tier. The lore holds so much promise, I just wish we could have gotten a little something more. All of these sphinxes that we have seen thus far are worth running. Each of them has at least a couple of redeeming qualities. Some have even outright greatness. But as we know, the final tier is reserved for the best of the best, creatures that manage excellence in many different areas. In low S tier, we have the Gynasphinx from the 5th edition Monster Manual. She, along with the Androsphinx, expand upon the Sphinx lore that began in 4e, namely that they are guardians with divine connections who guard sacred locations and protect the treasure and secrets of the gods. They have no need to sleep or to eat, and they have endless patience. They hold a vigilant watch over their charges on and on and on. When seekers come to the lair that the Sphinx guards, they are put to a grand test. Riddles, puzzles, tests of skill and combat, and so on. As the lore describes, the Gyna Sphinxes are more inclined towards riddles and intellectual tests, whereas the male Andro Sphinxes lean more towards tests of valor and courage. If the characters succeed, the rewards they can access are tremendous. But if they fail, the Sphinx will attack out of duty. That said, there are some Sphinxes that serve very benevolent gods, and in lieu of trying to kill failed adventurers, these Sphinxes will transport the characters away such that they cannot find the protected location again. Such Sphinxes are exceptions, for in true lawful neutral fashion, most Sphinxes carry out their grim duty and attempt to tear and rend the characters until there is nothing left of them but bones. Abilities-wise, the Gyna Sphinx has the core traits and features we know so well. Flight, true sight, certain resistances and immunities, and an inscrutable mind. She casts spells as a ninth level wizard, such as shield, darkness, suggestion, dispel magic, banishment, greater invisibility, and very fittingly, legend lore. So, some great spells all around, and they sync up well with her traits. She also has three legendary actions, such as extra claw attacks, a 120-foot teleport, and extra castings of spells. She does not have legendary resistance, though I wish she did. I think it would have been worth making her like one CR higher for some legendary resistance, which really fits well with the powerful guardian theme as well as the possibility of her being a solo monster against a whole party. Let's move over to the abilities of the Androsphinx, which I think puts him a slight notch even higher, earning him the top place in the Sphinx ranking. He casts spells like a 12th level cleric, 
including such spells as Command, Zone of Truth, Dispel Magic, Banishment, Freedom of Movement, Flame Strike, and, for curative purposes, Hero's Feast and both Lesser and Greater Restoration. What really sets the Andrus Sphinx apart are, of course, the Roars. He has three per day, each featuring an incredible range of 500 feet. The first one frightens, the second one paralyzes frightened creatures, and the third one deals a whopping 8d10 thunder damage. All of this on top of all the baseline features that we've seen with the Gyna Sphinx and other Sphinxes throughout the editions. But that's not all. Things get even more epic when we look at the layer actions. Both the Andro Sphinx and the Gyna Sphinx can deploy these. So potent are these effects that each one can only be used once per short or long rest, which is not a stipulation that we often see in layer effects. Three of the layer actions change the flow of time. The first makes everyone reroll initiative. The second one makes each creature get either older or younger by 1d20 years on a failed con save. And the third one makes everything and every one in the layer move forward or backward up to 10 years in time, with only the Sphinx being aware of this shift. Nothing short of a wish spell can return an affected creature to its normal time. This is just one of those things that after you read it, you have to reread it to believe what you just read, and immediately the gears of your mind start turning, wondering the implications of this effect happening. The fourth layer action allows the Sphinx to plane shift itself and up to seven other creatures with no save to resist. It can return to its layer as merely a bonus action and take any of those creatures back with it. Or not. It can leave them wherever it took them. These layer actions are simply amazing. They are so unique and you rarely see things like this in the game. Some people will claim that they are overpowered, and yes, they are, if you want to look at things in that way. I see it more as an expression of how the Sphinx is such a special type of being and directly connected with a god. So I really have to give high praise to the designers of the 5th edition Sphinx. The Andrus Sphinx and the Gyna Sphinx are so well done in about every way. They get nearly a full page of lore, and it's some really great lore at that. There's even a sample riddle attributed to the Gyna Sphinx of White Plume Mountain, though it's a very easy riddle to solve. The 5e Sphinxes have superbly dynamic and effective mechanics, and are about as role-playing oriented as a creature can get. Their style is also great overall, though I do wish that they were a bit more human-like in the face. Not that all Sphinxes need to have human heads, but the core ones should, or at least be pretty close to it. As with 4e, their heads are definitely much more lion-like, but these are just tiny nitpicks. Bravo, I say. These are a couple of the coolest monsters in 5th edition. I also can't let a Sphinx exclusive video go by without mentioning another Sphinx that fills my heart with glee. A couple years ago, when I was working on my first D&D book, Esper's Emporium of Esoterica, I did a bard stream in which I conceptualized a new monster using suggestions from the live comments. Well, that turned out to provide the origin for the Nycta Sphinx, which is featured in the bestiary section of the Emporium. It combines the Sphinx, which is one of my very favorite monsters, with the Owl, one of my very favorite animals. The illustration was done by the highly talented Ashkan Gambari, and it looks just amazing. It features lore, four different riddles, a stat block with a fantastic array of abilities, and layer actions. I would love to show it off, but this video is already running kind of long but there's a whole bunch packed into the pages of the Night to Sphinx. I really hope you get a chance to take a look at it or even run it in one of your own games. Without a doubt, this is one of my favorite monsters in the Emporium. I'm just so happy that it made it in there. And I'm also very happy to have such cool viewers who help participate in the creation of things like this. If you're interested in getting a copy of the Emporium in hardcover or PDF, or if you'd like to pre-order my upcoming 5e book, Monstrous Heroes, check out the links down in the video description. 
You'll see them down there along with the link to sign up for the newsletter. I wish you the best with unraveling and untangling the mysteries of your own life. And as always, may your adventures be many.